The Armenian Genocide. Whether or not you believe it happened, it happened. It was in progress a hundred years ago. It had by now reached the point where even the Ottoman Empire's staunchest allies were speaking out against it, and this week, one of those allies was even removed from office. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. I'm sitting here in a hotel in Przemysl, Poland, because our studio in Berlin is being rebuilt, and we figured that it would be better to keep our continuity than to miss a week, and we know you'd complain if we did, so this is what you get. Last week at the Somme saw British success at the battles of Morval and Tiepval Ridge. Greek volunteers were helping the Allied Five-Nation Army in the Balkans, and German General Erich von Falkenhayn crossed the Carpathian Mountains to engage Romania. Here's what followed. There was action on the other Romanian front in Dobrogea. On October 2nd, the Romanians put up a pontoon bridge across the Danube at Rahova, well to the rear of German General August von Mackensen's lines. They overwhelmed the surprised Bulgarian forces under Mackensen stationed there, seized all the neighboring villages, and for the next day, it looked like they'd deal Mackensen a shocking defeat. But apparently, they didn't have the necessary forces to do it, because they retired back across the bridge. The Bulgarians claimed that an Austrian ship appeared on the river and began shelling the bridge, and that before the retreat had been completed, a lot of the Romanians had been captured or killed. But I can't find out definite info on that. The Berlin dispatches, at any rate, claim few prisoners, and the region quieted down again for the rest of the week. And here's more from the German political dispatches. On October 3rd, Paul Graf Wolf Metternich leaves his post as German ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. He was recalled by Germany at Ottoman Minister of War Enver Pasha's request because Metternich objected to the Armenian genocide. He was quite outspoken on the subject. Wilhelm Radovitz becomes the interim charge d'affaires. But the next day, Radovitz reported to German Chancellor Bethmann Holweg that of 2 million Armenians that had been living in Anatolia, 1.5 million had been deported, and of those, 1,175,000 were dead. The chronology of the Great War actually says Richard von Kuhlmann was the new ambassador from September 29th, but he wouldn't arrive in Constantinople until November. Kuhlmann believed initially that the Armenian issues were a matter of internal politics, but would later say, this policy of extermination will for a long time stain the name of Turkey. And on October 5th, the Ottoman government confiscated all real estate held by Armenians. Let's look a few hundred kilometers due west from Constantinople to the Salonika front, where the Allied Five-Nation Army was on the move. On September 30th, the British cross the Struma River and take the local villages. They beat back the Bulgarian counterattack. On the 2nd, the Serbs report they've consolidated their positions on the heights of Kaimak Chalan and had advanced and taken Kochovie. Meanwhile, the Bulgarians are retiring towards Monastir. On the 4th, the Allies reach Kanali, 15 kilometers from Monastir, and the Serbs cross the Cherna River east of Monastir. At the end of the week, the French take Yermani on the lower shore of Little Prespa Lake. An interesting side note here, on October 3rd, the 10th Irish Division attacked Bulgarian positions at Yenikoi. The town changed hands several times until a night attack by the Irish took it for good for the time being, and the Bulgarians pulled back. You don't usually think of Irish fighting Bulgarians when you think of World War I, but it happened. And yet another side note, on October 6th, Bulgarian poet Dimko Debelyanov was killed fighting the Irish. His poems became very popular after his death. One place you do think of Irish fighting, and indeed all of the British colonial armies fighting, was at the Somme. On October 1st, the Battle of Le Transloy and the Battle of Ancre Heights began. Now, I'll talk more about them next week, particularly as bad weather for most of the week prevented any really big action, though there was a fair amount of action this week and every week. I want to talk a bit about British Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig. Haig still didn't seem to understand the kind of operations his troops could handle with success, specifically those limited in scope to the range of the guns covering the infantry advance. Every time he planned an offensive, 
the cavalry was assembled and distant objectives were set. And thinking about the big breakthrough distracted from reality-based things like artillery concentration. So battles kept resulting in heavy casualties for the British attackers. And while optimism is certainly a good thing, Haig's persistent belief before each new offensive that German morale was just about to collapse was not only a fantasy, but resulted in exhausted soldiers being asked for additional efforts because the enemy was teetering on the edge of collapse. There was also this. Now that they had taken most of the Tiepval morval Ridge, future advances would be into a valley and the Germans would have the observation advantage. Also, the autumn rains usually turned up in October at the Somme, which would make advancing difficult in general. Another also, three German trench lines had been captured, true, but they had built a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth line. And though they weren't as strong or as complex as the first three, reaching them required a seven kilometer advance, which is pretty much how far the Allies had advanced in the past three months total. And even if things went a bit quicker now, this would mean extending the campaign into winter. Would Haig be so reckless as to take the risk? There was never a chance that he would do anything else. Haig ordered his forces to take the rest of Tiepval Ridge and the outer defenses of the Transloy Line. But this was only the first step in Haig's ever-expanding designs. He was, once again, looking at distant places as the real goal for his armies. On September 30th, he met with Charles Cavanaugh, the leader of the Cavalry Corps, and told him to check out the area north of the River Ancre for a possible surprise attack. Okay, reasonable enough. But he continued by talking about an enemy collapse and how the cavalry would pursue them when that happened. There would be a three-army strike, Henry Rawlinson's men attacking the Transloy line and advancing to Beaumetz and then encircling Cambrai from the southeast, Hugh Gow and his reserves operating on Rawlinson's left, and Edmund Allenby's troops being the northern pincer, attacking south of Arras and cutting off the enemy from the north. Now, you have to realize what this would entail. For Rawlinson to advance to Beaumetz and then to Cambrai would be a 40 kilometer advance, six times the distance his men had covered since July 1st. For Gao, it was about the same distance, while Allenby had the luxury of only around 35 kilometers. Does anyone think there was any chance whatsoever that this could happen at this point? For this to work, the German army would have to completely collapse and if just a few machine guns were still active, the cavalry, which Haig still saw as the major player in the breakthrough, would be slaughtered. The Somme, by Robin Pryor and Trevor Wilson, says this was not an example of prescient forward planning. It bore the characteristics of something concocted at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. One could, I suppose, argue that this was in fact just imagination and a best case contingency plan and Haig was just theorizing. But Haig did meet with all those generals and lay out how the separate locations would be attacked. Okay, spoiler alert. Not one single part of this grand plan was ever enacted, but it does show how Haig was still thinking. Even just before winter, after three months of grinding, creeping battle, he was still looking at the Somme in terms of a single, decisive Napoleonic battle that would break the Germans. And that battle, to Haig, would come after infantry and artillery broke into the German lines and then the cavalry would break through. But cavalry had no place on a Western Front entrenched battlefield. Haig did not see this, even as October rolled in. And the first week of October 1916 ends, with new battles and new daydreams at the Somme, the Romanians hitting the Bulgarians from behind, the five-nation army advancing in the Balkans, and a German ambassador losing his post, because of his outspoken critique of the Armenian genocide. And this week, the German government, the Ottoman Empire's strongest ally, is informed that over half of the Armenian population in Anatolia is now dead. Two months ago, I mentioned that the three biggest battles in the history of the world so far were being fought simultaneously. Verdun, the Somme, and the Brusilov Offensive. You know what? None of those battles had over 50% of their soldiers die, but that's what happened 
to the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, and Graf Metternich was removed from office for speaking out against it. This was modern war. If you'd like to see what was going on with the Armenians before the war, you can click right here to see our episode about that. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Yatsek Kamilie. Thanks to Yatsek and people like him, we're able to go on location to places like Pshemisil Fortress and shoot even better episodes. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.